Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for this USCA consensus program briefing uh, with the Southwest Research Institute uh, presenting their uh, C CCUS in clean energy development work looking at oxy fuel combustion in advanced power generation turbines. Uh, my name is Alex Krauka. I'm a Seattle based consultant for USCA's consensus program. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, the consensus program is a cooperative agreement uh, founded in 2008, or the program is founded in 2008 um, in cooperation with the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management uh, that seeks to educate the public, policymakers, industry, and other stakeholders and build a consensus on the wide array of benefits of carbon capture, utilization, sequestration, and other carbon management technologies. Uh, such as blue hydrogen, uh, rare earth elements, uh, critical minerals, uh, things of that nature. Uh, we do this work through a series of, of briefings, such as the one that we're holding today. Um, we will have uh, workshops both in person during normal times, virtual during COVID times. Um, and then we put out a series of, of reports throughout the year as well um, as having a, a monthly news clips um, that, that we put out to, to keep our stakeholders in, informed of industry happenings. Um, if you're not already on our mailing list and, and would like to subscribe, uh, please email my colleague, Michelle Littlefield at mlittlefield at usca.org. Um, regarding logistics of uh, the webinar today, uh, if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free to um, type them into the Q&A box. As, as you'll see here, um, we will uh, do our best to answer as many as possible. Um, we will we'll, we'll take sort of mini breaks uh, in between each of our speakers to, to answer any questions that, that may have come in. Um, and if not, then um, we will uh, wait till the end uh, and, and do Q&A then as well. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, the, the recording uh, will be posted to the event page. Um, please allow a day or two to, for that to happen, um, and we will uh, plan to notify you once it does. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to pass it over to our, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Tim Allison, Mas Machinery Department Director at Southwest Research, Research Institute. Um, and with that, Tim, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Alex. Bring up my screen. Okay. And it works, wonderful. Um, thanks to all of you who are joining this morning. Um, excited to talk about a, a, a topic that we've been working on for some years now. Um, so uh, as Alex introduced, uh, I'm Tim Allison. I'm the director of SWERI's or Southwest Research Institute's machinery department. Um, and our goal today is to talk through um, some of the fundamentals of oxy fuel combustion with supercritical CO2 power cycles. What does that all mean? Um, and share some of some updates on recent progress we've had on projects that are developing turbines and combustors for this really exciting technology. Um, you know, you, you did briefly mention or introduce my, my co-authors. So I want to acknowledge them here as well. Um, um, so you, they're all very active, either PIs or task leads on, on the various projects we'll be talking about today. Um, and just by way of um, background, I'll, I'll introduce who we are for just a few minutes and um, go over some of the fundamentals of oxy fuel, well, of, of SCO2 cycles and oxy fuel cycles. And then um, Stefan Sitch will talk for a while about the turbine development projects we've had. Steve White will give an overview of combustor development. Uh, and Owen Pryor will talk about how these cycles or systems will integrate with energy storage. Um, which um, helps to accommodate uh, deeper penetrations of variable renewable power. Uh, just by way of who we are, um, all of us work at Southwest Research Institute. Uh, Southwest, and, and we say SWERI for short. Uh, so SWERI is a, 
a not-for-profit private research institute in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, you can see the aerial view shown here. Uh, we've been around since 1947 um, and are um, a, a 403B not-for-profit um, institute. Um, sorry, 401C3 not-for-profit institute. Um, we're a fairly large place. So we have about 1,500 acres. You can see the many buildings and labs shown here. Uh, there's about 2,800 employees um, that live here and or that work here. And our goal is to do applied research and development uh, across many spaces. So we have um, a variety of labs ranging from um, deep sea uh, test facilities. Um, we work um, um, on, on large fabrication or, or analysis of pressure vessels there, uh, all the way to deep space. Uh, where we have clean rooms to build satellites or satellite instrumentation here. We've done science leads for NASA on space missions. Um, we have ballistics ranges for um, looking at penetration mechanics or hypersonics type work uh, to, to many vehicle um, test cells, uh, over 100 engine test cells with dynamometers or emissions measurements. So we really do a, a, a wide range of applied research and development. I've called out some of our facilities um, that exist on site that support clean energy type projects. Um, and you can see that when we say applied, um, you know, we also mean relatively large scale, not just bench scale. Um, so some of the facilities that we have here, uh, we host a five megawatt PV plant with a, a battery and that's right next to a battery um, testing and abuse testing, reuse and abuse testing center. Um, some of our vehicle labs focus on improving efficiency of, of automotive drive drivetrains or, or automobile electrification. Um, we're also doing work with hydrogen testing of, of uh, reciprocating engines. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more later today about the 10 megawatt demonstration plant that we have that will be a first of a kind demonstration for supercritical CO2 power cycles. Um, you know, I, I, I also mentioned briefly that SCO2 um, even oxy fuel combustion can be used for energy storage. So energy storage is another area that we're active in and we have a demonstration loop um, that, that uh, is designed to show and prove operability for a pumped heat energy storage system. Um, our chemical engineering group also does a number of work that supports clean energy. Um, so they have some pilots showing uh, methane pyrolysis, CO2 mineralization and low carbon fuels. Um, we do work with hydrogen systems or carbon capture systems, including um, some of our large scale drivetrains or closed loop test facilities there. Um, and are looking right now actually at possibilities of uh, putting a net zero power generation pilot on site. Um, and there's many architectures that, that might feed into that. Um, so again, this is an area we're very active in and, and care about quite a bit. Uh, my department within Southwest Research Institute is called the Machinery Department, and all of the folks presenting today are from that department. Um, and uh, we are a portion of the Institute of about 75 staff performing research on machinery uh, or machinery-based systems. Uh, so we serve several industries, uh, oil and gas, aviation, uh, liquid propulsion and, and, and space, uh, as well as power generation. Um, I don't want to talk through all the images on the right, but um, they're intended to show that we have capabilities to um, start from the very beginning of power cycle design and optimization, uh, and then to design, build, and operate um, a machinery-based system or a turbo machine. And that includes test rigs all the way up to full-scale um, closed-loop test facilities. We have several three megawatt compressor skids um, all the way up to in the middle, um, a 10 megawatt electric pilot scale uh, power plant using supercritical CO2, which you'll hear more about later. Uh, more on our advanced power um, research efforts. Uh, I mentioned some of these on the map earlier, um, but we're currently doing active projects supporting decarbonization of, of the power grid. Um, and that includes things like long duration energy storage um, that are non-battery solutions that um, will help accommodate variable renewables um, for, for longer durations of time using machinery based systems. Um, Supercritical CO2 power cycles exist to improve the efficiency or reduce the emissions 
of, of power generation. Um, we've got some work going on in advanced combustion, including a gas turbine test facility that's capable of up to 100% hydrogen combustion. Um, we've done work on carbon capture and sequestration technologies, both on the chemical side as well as on the compression side. In fact, the image you see in the lower right here is a carbon capture um, compressor um, designed with uh, unique intercooling that helps reduce the power penalty associated with CO2 compression. Um, so we do work on, on, on all these things ranging from the cycle to the components. Um, some of our test loop capabilities are unique um, where we've developed first of a kind designs um, for compressors, expanders, and combustors. You'll hear about many of those today. Uh, we can go up to a 4,000 PSI or 13, 20 degrees Fahrenheit of uh, inside the pipe temperature, higher temperatures, of course, for, for combustor exit conditions. Um, and the scales are from one up to 10 megawatts, um, so very large scale. Okay, let me dive in technically and talk about supercritical CO2 power cycles. Um, first is, I guess, what are they? Um, and so this chart shows a temperature entropy diagram for different types of power cycles and images of what is the, a typical machine that goes along with them. Um, so the existing commercial state of the art is it, for power cycles is probably um, most commonly known as gas turbine power cycles. So you can see an air breathing gas turbine here. Um, and that's a, that incorporates a Brayton cycle where you have compression, uh, heat addition, expansion, and then heat rejection. Let me change to a pointer and make sure you guys can see. Okay, again, um, this is the compression part. The top is the heat addition part through combustion. Um, this is the expansion part. Uh, and then this is the heat rejection part. Um, or, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got that backwards. I'm thinking of pH diagrams. So this is the compression part. Um, um, No, okay, I think I got that all right. My apologies. So again, that's an industrial commercial technology with, um, with, a, with an air breathing gas turbine. Um, people are also very familiar with steam turbine cycles where you have a boiler feed water pump, a heat addition or a boiler which goes through the liquid vapor region, um, usually with some superheat up into the vapor region, region uh, expansion through a steam turbine. Uh, if it's a condensing cycle, it expands into the dome. Uh, and then a condenser, and then back around to the pump inlet. So both of those are commercial state of the art. A supercritical CO2 cycle or a supercritical cycle just operates on a different regime of the, 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 the phase diagram, um, where instead of going down to where you have vapor or liquid separation, we're operating at pressures and temperatures above the critical point, um, where you then operate with what's known as a supercritical fluid. Um, and you don't have any condensation if it's a fully supercritical cycle because you just never get to where uh, the fluid will condense. Um, CO2 in particular um, is, a, is a fluid that is attractive for operating in supercritical CO2 cycles. Um, the reasons are that the critical temperature is fairly close to ambient temperature. So you can operate near the critical point uh, with, with ambient heat rejection. Um, and, and that allows for high cycle efficiencies. Uh, CO2 is also very dense when it's a supercritical CO2 fluid or supercritical fluid. Um, and so that reduces the size of some of the, the costly components in the cycle. Uh, CO2 is also an attractive working fluid for several other reasons um, besides its thermodynamics. Um, and, and that is that, I mean, it's widely available. Um, the corrosion characteristics seem uh, moderate. Uh, no worse than the steam systems that we're, we're used to dealing with. Um, it's inert, it's, it's not toxic. Um, and so in, in many ways, it's an it's a excellent working fluid for power cycles. Um, another point to make about these CO2 cycles is unlike a, a gas turbine cycle where you're bringing in ambient air um, and then exhausting it to atmosphere, most supercritical CO2 cycles are closed or semi-closed, meaning that the same molecules are being used at all points in the cycle. Um, and so 
for a fully closed system, um, you'd have zero leakage to atmosphere if you're adding heat through a heat exchanger. Um, and so it's just, again, the same molecules. So it can actually be a net zero CO2 system, uh, even though CO2 is used as a working fluid. So if you step away from a temperature entropy diagram and look at what are the actual cycle type layouts, there are many. Um, so what I showed in the prior slide was a very simple Brayton cycle, where, as I mentioned, you have cooling, uh, compression, heating, and then expansion. That's just a simple Brayton cycle that many simple cycle gas turbines follow. Uh, with supercritical CO2, you can improve the efficiency uh, a lot by going through recuperation. Um, this is sometimes done on gas turbines as well, but with a recuperated cycle, you cool, you go through a compressor, and then you actually pick up heat from the turbine exhaust before you go to your primary heat source. So that's done through a heat exchanger called a recuperator. Um, so that, that raises the temperature of the CO2, um, goes to the heat source through the expander, uh, and then the expander discharge goes to the other side of that heat exchanger um, to recover some of the, the gas turbine waste heat. Or not the gas turbine, from the expander waste heat. Um, so that increases the efficiency. Most, most types of SCO2 cycles that are considered for, for commercialization involve some level of recuperation just to achieve those efficiency benefits. Um, there are further variations. I won't spend a whole lot of time on these, um, but you can um, run cycles. I'll talk more about oxycombustion cycles in a minute. Um, but again, with different staged recuperation and different types of heat addition, uh, if you actually have access to low temperatures below ambient, then, um, or if your ambient temperatures are low, then the, the CO2 does turn into liquid phase. And so you can go to transcritical cycles where there's pumps and compressors, not just compressors. Um, one of the more efficient cycles that's con considered um, for many indirect heat applications is the recompression cycle. Um, it's a variation on the recuperated cycle where the recuperation is broken to two recuperators. And that's just to avoid some fluid properties mismatch on the hot cold streams. So it allows for better uh, heat transfer and further increases efficiency. A little bit more on the why on SCO2. Um, so SCO2, like I, I mentioned, it has good thermodynamic properties. And that translates to an increase in power cycle efficiency over what can be achieved with supercritical steam turbines um, or air Brayton turbines at comparable temperatures. So, um, and that can be somewhere in the range of three to 5% higher, um, depending on the temperature that we're talking about. Um, so that type of efficiency gain is very attractive. Um, and that's over, depending on conditions, over supercritical steam or organic Rankine cycles. Um, I mentioned that the CO2 density in the supercritical state is very high, um, and it can be somewhere around, um, you know, even up to a half or in that order of magnitude, the density of water. And so what that means for the machinery is that you get very compact turbo machinery with power densities that are comparable more to rocket turbo pumps than to very large steam turbines. Um, so one of the earlier works, at least in, in since 2000 on SCO2 cycles, looked at the relative sizing of a steam turbine uh, with a supercritical CO2 turbine um, and showed about an order of magnitude reduction um, in the, the expected size of the turbine. Um, so that is attractive in that it can increase the transient response capabilities as well as decrease the capital costs for the turbo machinery. Uh, the efficiencies I mentioned are high. Uh, it's a, worth noting that they do require a lot of recuperation. So um, one of the aspects that's of interest for supercritical CO2 cycles is um, cost-effective compact heat exchangers to perform that, that recuperation cost-effectively and efficiently. Um, and then I mentioned that uh, the critical temperature of CO2 is near ambient, so it's 31 degrees Celsius, uh, which means that you can take advantage of some of the the high densities, uh, the low viscosities, uh, the low compression power of, of CO2 uh, at that temperature and enhance the cycle efficiency uh, with dry cooling. So to provide some more details on efficiencies, 
Um, here's a very a, a number of different power cycles efficiencies as a function of temperature. Um, so we're showing helium cycles that are closed loop, uh, SCO2 cycles that are closed, and then some of the steam cycles um, that are shown here. Um, a lot of different colored lines. The CO2 lines are the, the, the blue colored lines um, that are in the middle. And you can see um, that we achieve efficiencies. A, a common reference is around 700 degrees Celsius efficiencies that are over 50% thermal efficiency. Um, and that's higher than what a, a steam cycle would achieve, um, would be about, um, again, as we said, you know, five, three or five points lower. Um, and again, that's a function of temperature and what type of steam cycle. So um, you can, you know, in the waste heat recovery range, we're getting close to crossover in some cases between steam and, and SCO2, depending on uh, how many stages of reheat, um, how many pressure splits or, or casings there are in, in the steam turbine. There's some room where SCO2 has higher efficiencies than steam for waste heat recovery. And then at the higher temperatures, um, 700 C or more, um, SCO2 is a clear winner in terms of, of thermal efficiency. Uh, over in fossil, we start getting into higher temperatures and much higher efficiencies. But to achieve these, uh, we have to, to do combustion within the working fluid because there's not a current heat exchanger that can survive working temperatures at the pressures that CO2 exists at. But at its heart, supercritical CO2 is just a heat engine, meaning it takes thermal energy and converts it to electricity. So it's applicable to a lot of different heat sources. Um, some of the common ones that are actively pursuing SCO2 um, are concentrating solar power, fossil fuel, uh, nuclear, and all these are, are targeting high temperatures um, and have high grade heat, especially with concentrating solar or nuclear, it's heat that can be recirculated or reused easily uh, through thermal storage or, or recirculation back to the, the, the core. Um, so these are high temperature cycles trying to achieve very high system efficiencies. Um, SCO2 is also applied towards lower temperature bottoming cycles. Um, there again, it's about efficiency benefits relative to steam or ORC down at those temperatures, um, combined with the, um, the compactness or modularity um, or benefits of a working fluid of CO2 versus some of those. And so those are waste heat recovery applications, uh, both gas turbine waste heat recovery or industrial process heat recovery um, or geothermal, low temperature geothermal applications. Um, for, for geothermal, it's a little bit larger, but for waste heat recovery, typical sizes are on the two to 10 megawatt scale. Let me talk a little bit about a project that defines the state of the art for some of the indirect SCO2 cycles, and then I'll, I'll start to pivot towards oxy combustion cycles. Um, the, the STEP project stands for Supercritical Transformational Electric Power. Uh, and is an ongoing project that SWERI has with uh, Gas Technology Institute, GE Research, and many others is shown in a joint industry program below. Um, it's, a, it's a project that's designed to advance the state of the art for supercritical CO2 power cycles through large scale um, demonstration of high efficiency cycles um, at temperatures of 715 degrees Celsius, showing a roadmap to 50% uh, power cycle efficiency through commercially procured components. Uh, so it's a fairly large effort. You can see that uh, the, the test facility that is, exists at Southwest Research Institute um, to house the, the power block. Um, our goal is that this be a reconfigurable facility that can be used as a test bed for different cycle layouts or different components as the supercritical CO2 industry matures. Uh, I mentioned that we're targeting 715 Celsius uh, turbine inlet temperatures, which is key towards hitting the efficiency metrics. Um, some of the, the primary equipment there um, are, are piping and heat exchangers that operate up to that temperature. Um, so those are made out of new or emerging nickel alloys like Inconel 740H. Um, and we are bringing up the supply chain for many of those. Um, our recuperators go up to about 600 degrees Celsius. Um, 
And because of the scale of our test facility, we are um, using a scalable architecture to hire, hire, to hire larger systems. Um, so we're proving all these components and at the same time demonstrating first of a kind um, large scale plant controls and operability at high temperatures, um, which have not yet been demonstrated um, before for SCO2 systems. Um, in terms of magnitude of the project, um, if you count both the project funding as well as the, the budget to, to build this test facility, we're, we're clocking in um, at an eventual total of around $150 million. Um, so it's a significant effort with, with many team members um, and is very close to where we're going to uh, be operational. So uh, construction is well underway. Uh, I'll show some pictures a little bit later, but we plan to demonstrate this SCO2 system in, in 2022, uh, late this year. Uh, that'll be a simple cycle um, operation, at least at first, and then moving into next year, going into a, a recompression cycle configuration. Um, again, just to, to be clear, what we're doing on STEP is taking advantage of past component development efforts on first-of-a-kind turbines, first-of-a-kind compressors, um, heat exchanger development, um, and we're bringing all those component research items together into a full functioning pilot scale power cycle. Um, and so that involves next generation components uh, where lessons learned from the first gen ones are being um, incorporated. Um, like most all of the components at this point are commercially procured. Um, which, which does drag up the supply chain for these types of cycles some more. Uh, and then our goal is again, to show with these more mature components, what does it take to do full scale uh, operation at high temperatures and high efficiency? So this image shows uh, uh, the, the layout of the, the step power block um, with some images of the different components that are here. Um, it's a lot to take in, so I'll just try to march around it fairly quickly um, so we can get to talking about oxy combustion. But um, we have a, a 70 megawatt thermal, which is firing natural gas and providing heat to the cycle. Um, that heat comes through a first of a kind um, primary process heater um, using Inconel 740. So hot air blows across the tubes and heats the CO2. Um, and then, of course, within the loop, we have recuperators, coolers. Uh, most of these are printed circuit heat exchangers um, to a large scale cooling water system for heat rejection. Our inventory management system is what adds or removes CO2 from the loop. Uh, we have two different compressors for a recompression cycle. So there's a main compressor and then over on the lower left, a bypass compressor with associated cooling and filters um, before each of those. Uh, there are two recuperators. So here's a, the, the high temperature recuperator will be arriving in just, I think, a couple weeks. Uh, the low temperature recuperator is already on site. Uh, and then we've got a, a first of a kind turbine stop valve um, through the heater and then a, a turbine um, uh, that will run at the conditions of 250 bar and 715C. So I think I went through most of the specs and I'm, got, I'm running short on time. So I'm gonna skip this slide with another layout of, of what the test facility looks like. Uh, most of what we'll talk about today actually is a next step beyond um, where the STEP project is going. So the STEP project demonstrates a, a full temperature um, pilot scale indirect cycle where the heat is supplied through um, heat exchange. Um, if you wanna start talking about carbon capture or even higher efficiencies um, through high temperatures, you've got to do combustion within the process. And by doing that, you avoid some of the metal temperature limits that exist um, when you're trying to add heat through a heat exchanger where you have to go through a metal wall. So this cycle on the upper right here demonstrates what's meant, at least conceptually, through oxy combustion. Uh, it's, it's again showing a, a closed, or in this case, a semi-closed cycle, um, where we have cooling, compression, recuperation, and then heat addition. In this case, the heat addition is through combustion instead of a heat exchanger. So we're adding fuel and oxygen 
uh, with a high CO2 concentration mixture here. Um, the combustion can get to temperatures that are much higher than what you than, than 715 degrees Celsius. Um, it would connect directly to an expander um, and then go through the rest of the power cycle. You actually produce water, CO2, and there's some other combustion byproducts here. So it's not a fully closed cycle. Uh, the mass goes in, the mass has to come out. Um, so typically you can remove the mass um, uh, during water con condensation at the pre-cooling phase. Uh, and then the CO2 can be removed at different locations. Um, and the key thing about doing that CO2 removal within a supercritical CO2 power cycle is that it can be removed at sequestration ready pressures. So there's not any penalty for, um, and, and it's at high purity already as well. So there's not really a, um, an add-on penalty for the, the CO2 capture or compression. Um, and so what that means is that SCO2 cycles with oxy combustion are, are cost and, and efficiency competitive over natural gas combined cycle uh, with carbon capture. So that's the big carrot. Um, you know, when you run a system like this as well, uh, there's very little nitrogen in the system. And so um, you don't really get NOx production, the levels you'd worry about with a gas turbine. Um, so that's, that's really what's driving interest in, in the oxy combustion cycles. Um, it's worth pointing out that there are new components beyond what we're demonstrating on step. Uh, particularly the combustion operates in a regime that's, that's still not anywhere near as well understood as, as gas turbine combustion. Um, you're, you're trying to run a fire in a, in a high CO2 concentration um, and, so, and also at a high pressure. So if you were to map out what is industry experience of, of CO2 concentration, um, there's, there's some experience at high CO2 concentrations at low pressures. Um, that's related to, to oxy combustion type systems at low pressure. Um, at high pressure, there's combustion information and experience, but not really at high CO2 concentrations. So the knowledge front on a pressure versus CO2 concentration curve looks like the lower right. Um, the SCO2 oxy combustion application is kind of out here in the corner where we're heading high CO2 concentrations, high pressures, um, and so, um, you know, there's a lot that's new about that. Uh, this chart is a little bit old, so there's been work done in the last few years to help build up combustion mechanisms for this regime. Um, there's even been uh, some commercial testing um, of closed loop oxy combustion at these conditions. But as you can imagine, uh, as we start to look at different fuel compositions and so on, um, there's still not a lot of experience about um, combustor designs or combustion behavior, including all the closed loop chemistry that's involved with SCO2 oxy combustion. So there's a lot of work then going on on combustor development. Um, and then the combustor exit temperatures can be quite high. So going up to close to 1200 degrees Celsius or so, um, and that's gonna require a cooled turbine. So the turbines that are needed for an SCO2 oxy combustion system will look different than the turbines that we're demonstrating on step, uh, which are, which, um, have pressure vessel walls that, that can accommodate the full temperature. Um, so the rest of our talk today is gonna talk about those components. Um, Stefan Sitch will talk about oxy combustion turbines and some of the design work that we've done to bring those forward. Uh, and then Steve White will talk about um, combustors um, and Owen Pryor will finish up on some of the system and how SCO2 oxy combustion can work with energy storage. Uh, with that, I'll turn the screen over to Stefan. While we're changing the screen, um, let me do a quick check for questions. Yeah, Tim, it looks like um, a, a question came in um, regarding how uh, how this is kind of different than the technology that that Net Power has has been uh, advertising that they've developed uh, with regards to. Uh, oxy fuel and supercritical CO2? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, and I guess let me answer that question in two parts really quickly, and then we can go more details later if we need to. Um, the, I talked a lot about the STEP project, um, and that is uh, separate from oxy fuel combustion because it involves indirect heat addition. Um, and so all the components there are um, more applicable to things like um, concentrating solar power or waste heat recovery where we're not doing combustion in the stream. Um, and all of that is very different. Um, regarding 
our work on oxy combustion, um, we're, we're well aware of the net power work um, and they have done some really impressive things with their facility in Laporte. Um, I'd say the work that we do is complementary. Um, so just if you look as, at the gas turbine industry today, um, there's not just one company that, that has the expertise in developing that. Uh, similarly, there's the, the industry right now on oxy fuel combustion is relatively narrow. Um, and so we hope to expand both technical understanding and as well as industry familiarity around SCO2 and oxy combustion systems. Um, there's not a lot of technical data that, I mean, that is coming out of um, some of the commercial work that's done and that's understandable. Um, you know, they're using their funds to develop it. Um, so our, our goal on some of these DOE funded projects is to um, help expand that knowledge base and, and share the information that we're developing uh, through that. And then some of the components that we develop would actually probably have a, a commercial roadmap to support um, things like net powers alum cycle. So it's complementary in that sense as well. Okay, Great. Thank for you time for limits, let's, sure. For time limits, let's move on to, to uh, Stefan and then we can talk more questions at the end. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, so I'm going to go over a couple of the projects that we've been leading on the development of these oxy fuel turbines. Uh, both are in the 300 megawatt range. One is a natural gas fired cycle, which is similar to the alum cycle currently in development. Um, and then there's also a coal syngas combustion cycle, which similar to the natural gas, except we're using a gasifier coal uh, syngas cleanup process, which does take a pretty good hit on cycle efficiency. Um, but that was funded under the Colt FIRST program. So the first program I'm going to go over is actually just focused on conceptual sizing on what a 300 megawatt electric power plant turbine would look like. So this is going to be a 450 megawatt mechanical turbine for a net power 300 megawatt electric cycle. Um, so as Tim mentioned, you know, this, this is looking at direct fire turbines versus the indirect fire turbines, which is the step facility that we've been uh, discussing. Now, the uh, direct fire there, they're going up to higher temperatures. This particular cycle is going up to 1200 Celsius. Um, one of the, in, in terms of limitations, what the, the indirect fired cycles are limited based on the material temperatures on the heater going upstream of the turbine. These direct fired cycles are now limited by the temperature downstream of the turbine due to that internal recuperation. There is a lot of development going on in terms of high temperature recuperators, but right now the exhaust temperatures are in the 725 to 775 C range. Um, this turbine, instead of being a three to one pressure ratio, it is a 10 to one pressure ratio. So we're coming in at around 300 bar and exiting at 30. Um, and so that's why this cycle doesn't involve just a single compressor, it involves a um, vapor compressor plus a liquid or a supercritical CO2 pump. So multi stages of compressor, multiple pumps, um, single turbine to generate this power. But it, these cycles do start pushing the 60 65% thermal efficiency. And as Tim mentioned, um, they start competing with the natural gas combined cycle, especially when we start to take into account the carbon capture. So this one, as I mentioned, this program was really just looked at focusing on what does the cycle look like? What will the turbine construction look like for the cycle? And mainly doing some trade studies for trying to find an optimal turbine design. The next program I'll talk about is actually taking that turbine from concept to more detailed design, but looking at addressing key risk items in terms of testing and development. So technical approach for this one was to develop a conceptual oxy fuel SCO2 combustion turbine design. Uh, we were partnered with uh, Southwest Research, General Electric, Air Liquide, uh, EPRI, and Georgia Tech. Uh, so we had a, a multidiscipline team, various uh, the teams looking at different parts of the program. Suri was lead with the lead in the mechanical design of the turbine. GE led Aero. Hi, Air Stefan. Liquide. Stefan, yes. you lost your slides. Okay, sorry, one second. Sorry about that. I think when I got met, let me here. Sorry, one second. I apologize. I think I got a message and it kicked me everything out. Okay. All right, can we see the slides again? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. 
And so part of the approach was looking at developing a thermodynamic cycle and then also doing um, optimization studies, looking at what all goes into the turbine. So with a direct fired a hot turbine like this, it does require cooling flow. So there is a balance of turbine flow path design, internal cooling, thermal management, and overall cycle efficiency. Um, so what we started to look at was take a mechanical approach, look at the limits on the turbine, which is going to be more of the rotor dynamics, mechanical, um, because we are trying to still contain 300 plus bar of internal pressure while having hot combustion flow coming through the system. So this is very similar to pressures higher than a steam turbine and temperatures like a gas turbine. So we're combining kind of advanced technology from both these systems into a single package. And how do we balance that in terms of design? So this just overlays the, the one of the cycle models, really just focus on the turbine, focus on the cooling flow coming in, the fuel flow, the oxygen, the recycle flow, which is mostly CO2. Uh, the main design parameters, as I mentioned before, turbine inlet is around 305 bar at 1200 C. Turbine exhaust is 30 bar, so the 10 to 1 pressure ratio. Uh, turbine power is around 450 megawatt mechanical for a th 300 megawatt cycle. Uh, and for this system, we are supplying cooling flow. I'll put that in quotation marks because it is still 400 Celsius coming into the turbine to provide the thermal management for the system. So one of the initial aspects of the project we looked at was just looking at what is the optimal stage count uh, for the turbine. So some general rules of thumb when it, when it comes to turbine sizing, the more stages, the more efficient. However, that is from an aero perspective only. The more stages you add, what that, that, that does two things. Well, you increase the number of stages, which increases the number of blades. More blades, more cost, more cooling. Uh, you also reduce hub diameter as you increase the stage count. Lower hub diameter, less stiffness in the rotor, more rotor dynamic issues, um, and they also increase length. So smaller hub diameter, shorter length or longer length actually is both detrimental to rotor dynamics, depending on where you're operating in terms of your MOS. And so there, there's a balance of trying to find the most efficient design that is mechanically feasible. And so this kind of overlays some of the different trade studies we did looking at how the hub diameter change, how the total efficiency changes. Um, and then looking at a single flow turbine, which means we're coming through uh, one end out the other, and then double flow split turbine, which means we're coming to the middle of the turbine and going out in two directions. So what, what we want to do is we want to take all of the flows going into the turbine between the single versus double flow, and we want to see what, what is the relative efficiency change, not just in terms of the cycle performance, I'm sorry, not just in terms of the turbine performance, but actually in terms of cycle performance. And so what you see is the table on the, on the, on the bottom, which is what we use to determine what our optimal turbine size would be. And so zero is, is our baseline. That was our initial sizing of an eight stage turbine. And everything else was looking at how does the net change with the different stage counts that based on our cooling flows, recycle flow, uh, overall aero efficiency in terms of net cycle efficiency. And so what we determined was that a five stage turbine, actually a five or six stage turbine, uh, both produce very similar changes in cycle efficiency. Um, for this particular program, we went with a five stage. We'll actually go over when we, when we went into the next phase to look at the detailed design, we actually moved to a six stage turbine due to some other mechanical limits and manufacturing concerns with the five stage. But you can see overall their uh, change in overall cycle efficiency is relatively the same. Part of the program was also looking at what does the combustor look like? And so what we're just seeing here is an example of a, uh, our straight through turbine uh, combustors, co combustor cans coming in at a 45 degree angle into kind of a collector plenum or transition piece. And then looking at uh, what, what would be the fuel required in the combustor? What's the temperature profile coming out of the combustor? And what we're really looking for here is uniform temperature uh, going into the turbine flow path. And so this was the initial a four can combustor. Now, when you think about combustor cans, this is a high pressure vessel. So the more penetrations into the vessel, the more difficult it is to design for pressure containment. Uh, so we would like to limit this as much as possible. However, the fewer cans, the more the the more variation in exhaust flow or inlet flow going to the turbine there will be. So there is a balance of mechanical design and combustor performance that we're trying to answer here in terms of what's the number of cans, what's the cho chosen plenum or transition piece geometry. So this just shows an initial layout of what the temperatures are coming into the turbine. And one of the things to really know out is actually on that figure on the left is you look at 
there's a very hot spot that comes right into uh, that's directly in line with the combustor can but you start getting much cooler uh, as you get away from the can so in between the various cans so what this is showing is that four combustor cans is not sufficient to give us uniform flow going into the turbine so this means we need to do some trade studies to look at how do we pick the optimal number of cans and so what we looked at was we looked at eight combustor cans, 10 combustion cans, and 12 combustion cans. And so what, what we got was that we realized that 12 is ideal, and you start getting a very low variation in temperature, down to only you know, about 5% with the 12 can design. More than 12 when we start having packaging issues, mainly because you're trying to bring in these 12 penetrations. You have to have flanges that support all these uh, cans. And so it really gets too difficult to just mechanically package. But we did choose between the 12 can and the 10 can. You know, the, the numbers are the same, but right now we are moving forward with the 12 can design. But when we're coming to this optimization, this is, this is what we're mainly concerned about, was looking at flow distribution and flow uniformity going into the turbine. As mentioned before, we also evaluated the rotor dynamics. We did multiple, you know, multiple designs with a back-to-back -back design, inlet, tur you know, straight through turbine design, and really looked at what would this um, behave like rotor dynamically. Um, typically with rotor dynamics, aerodynamics and rotor dynamics do not get along. Uh, and mainly being as we showed in the chart earlier, the more stages, the higher the aero efficiency, but the more stages, the worse this turbine will perform rotor dynamically. Uh, so that's why we had to come to a balance between aero and rotor and also look at the overall impact on cycle efficiency. And so the, the image on the right shows more of our near final five stage design. The image on the left was a back to back turbine design. The, the reason we evaluated that one was more for thrust balance uh, because if we went to a back to back design, we wouldn't need a high flow balance piston that is just a net loss. However, due to the rotor dynamic concerns, the increased cooling, um, it actually was, an, as was detrimental to our design. So we ended up going with a straight through turbine design, similar to what you would have on gas turbines versus steam turbines, which you'll see a lot of back-to-back -back designs. So just some rotor dynamic plots. I won't go into too many details here, but showing the comparisons between the, the inline design, the back-to-back -back design, showing the, res the responses of the various bearings and showing why we went with our current design. So that top right plot shows we have a critical speed right at where we're operating, at our operating speed uh, versus the other design, which shows we have significant margin. So along with the cycle efficiency, along with this mechanical integrity is the reason we chose this five stage straight through design. In addition on the program, what we started looking at was also 1D heat transfer assessment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we've started wanting to look at what internal cooling would be required to cool the blades. And so with these blades, what you're seeing on the chart on the right is that you have hot flow on the outside. There will be a layer of, of thermal barrier coatings or TBC. And then you have your, your high temperature nickel alloys or your, your metal along with an internal cooling flow. And so to really do this analysis before we get into more of the advanced 3D cooling flow analysis, everything was done 1D looking at your heat flux from the cooling or the heat flux from the hot flow, your internal heat transfer coefficients from the cold flow, and really just looking at how much cooling would be required. What our main target here was that we wanted to maintain a metal temperature target of around 750 Celsius. Uh, this is really when a lot of these high nickel alloys start to have creep issues or creep limitations and material properties. Uh, so I chose cho choosing 750C, that gives us significant margin on stress because these are gonna be small blades, highly loaded from pressure, from, from external pressures. Uh, and so we wanted, we really are gonna have some high mechanical stresses. Now, one of the unique aspects of these blades versus say steam turbines or gas turbines is that their overall rotating weight is much smaller. And so your rotating stresses are actually relatively low compared to the cross-sectional area of the blade because the blades are so small. Uh, for example, the first stage of this turbine is actually around 1.1 inches tall in terms of the blade height. The last stage is still only three inches. So very low pull loads from rotation. However, there are high pressure loading across each stage as you're thinking about, you know, going from 300 bar to 30 bar. So even that first stage, you're talking about 50 bar possibly across the turbine. Um, so very high pressure loading that does have to be considered in terms of mechanical stresses of the blades. We did do some 2D heat transfer assessment, just modeling the mid-span blade profile, looking at how what the internal passages will look like, give us some uh, different options. And so what we're looking at here is mainly, it's, it's an internal cooled uh, serpentine passage. And so we have flow coming in on the left and then it's serpentines through one, two, three, four, five, six. You have a pin fin array 
uh, on stage seven. And that's mainly for, that's not only for heat transfer enhancement at the trailing edge where you, you do start thinning off your TBC, it's also for structural support by allowing for some stiffness between the suction and pressure side of the airfoil. And then the trailing A edge is cooled by injection holes. So these are holes that are EDM af afterwards, or rather than internal, you know, they are still using internal cooling, but it's convection cooling um, through the trailing edge. But because it's so thin, you're not able to actually have a full annular passage and it requires these trailing edge cooling holes. But this is some of the analysis that went into our cycle model optimization in terms of looking at what's the cooling flow required. Uh, we did do some initial 3D blade modeling, very simplistic approach. Just wanted to look at more of just mechanical feasibility. There's no design optimization here, nothing in terms of the blade to rotor uh, contacts, but we did kind of go into the program, just looking at some overviews on, hey, is this feasible? Which we did, which we did show that this design conceptually does make sense. We looked at various shaft end and balance piston seals. So one of the big concerns with these high pressure cycles are leakage. Uh, one being the balance piston seal, which is for pressure balance in the system. Uh, and also actually for rotor dynamic benefit by having a high pressure balance piston seal, you also get a damping benefit that helps with your, with your modes. And then your shaft end seals. Um, what, what we ended up going with, with, with this system, instead of using a, a rotating seal, like a face seal, we're going with a labyrinth seal with capture kind of at the inner, near the exit. And so we will have a recapture, re-injection system that will pull low pressure CO2, almost creating a vacuum. So you pull CO2, some air, they will be separated and then re-inject into the system. So, you're, so you have a net zero or a zero emissions uh, from the whole system. And this led to looking at now what does the overall turbine conceptual layout look like? This in terms of when I say it's layout here, we have the rotor layout, we have the aero design. Now let's design a case around this system. Uh, just highlighting some of the temperatures and pressures in the system that we are having to seal and design mechanically. And so we, we still carried both designs through the five straight, the five, the five stage straight through and the 12 stage back to back. Um, it just also laid out some of the different advantages. Like I said, I won't go over this too much because we did end up choosing the five stage straight through straight through design. And that's the design we're, we're taking into the rest of the program or the follow on program. Um, but in terms of the overall case layout, what you see here is we kind of have a multi piece design. You have your housing for your combustor plenums on the left, the red, the red plenum on the left, your exhaust housing or diffuser on the right, the tan piece. Uh, but this really highlights the thermal management system for internal blade cooling and also just supplying all of the seal flows with relatively cool flow. And again, I say relatively cool because it's still 400 Celsius rather than, you know, compressor exhaust um, temperatures. And so mainly we have the, the main flow coming into the turbine at zone one. At zone two, you're supplying the stator vanes. So these stator vanes are still very, very hot. The first stage stator seeing the highest temperature and pressure combination in the entire system at around 1200 C and 305 bar. Um, the cooling flow also buffers the main case from the internal combustor. Uh, so what that allows us is by, by maintaining 400 C, we can actually use some more readily available materials rather than having to go to advanced nickel alloys for our external case that would only increase complexity, increase cost. And so we wanted to go with a 400 series stainless. And so that's, all, that's why we chose that 400 C um, temperature. But you can see the flow snakes around, supplies the balance piston seal at zone four, supplies the end seals at, at zone four C, and then internal blade cooling at five, five A and five B. And all this flow is returned into the turbine, turbine stream. So not all the flow is considered chargeable uh, because as the flow that does get injected in the earlier stages, it's still, you, you are able to extract power from the flow. Um, as it goes down to the further stages. So summary and project goals. So we, we showed that we can demonstrate a cycle that can achieve greater than 58% thermal efficiency. Uh, we developed aerodynamic dy design for first stage nozzle turbine blade with efficiency greater than 85%. Cool nozzle turbine blade concept. We developed the oxyfuel combustor or demonstrated it through CFD of 1200C. Conceptual light of the turbine, the rotor, and then we really start identifying what are those phase two goals that we would have to have for assessing the key risk items. And so that's what I want to lead into is the next program. And I think due to time, I'm going to go straight into the next, and then we can have time for questions combining both since they are very similar. So the next award was under the coal first program. Well, this time, instead of doing a natural gas fired cycle, this is a coal syngas fired cycle or just syngas in general. Um, and so we want to look at what, what would this turbine like, look like? How would it, what's the difference between this and a natural gas cycle? 
And the main reason being is mostly of kind of your cycle balance in terms of overall power required to operate the cycle, but also in really material compatibility, considering all of the other byproducts in a coal syn gas environment based on your cleanup. So the good thing about this program was we did have a good starting point because we had that conceptual sizing program early on. So I show on the right is a more advanced design of our further on turbine development, a more realistic casing on terms of the, the pink piece housing the combustors and the, the blue piece housing the rest of the turbine. Um, we're still in development on our bearing housing and support structures, but we have moved this design along to where we're moving into preliminary design more analysis, more feasibility studies, starting to get into a techno-economic assessment to look at the cost of this cycle and what are some of the items that we should uh, do trade studies between to really reduce the overall capex and opex of these various cycles. Uh, this team's a little bit different, but it is, so Southwest Research, we are prime. Um, Myself is managing the project along with our with Jeff Moore and uh, Florent Bocher on our material side. We have Eight Rivers Capital as a part of this project doing cycle modeling. Air Liquide is continuing support on combustion development. Um, General Electric supports the Turbine Aero. We also have Electric Power Research Institute is uh, doing the technical economic assessment. And then we also brought in two more universities, Purdue and University of Central Florida. Purdue is leading the detailed aero design and University of Central Florida is developing really the heat transfer of these uh, of SCO2 fluids at these conditions that are required for the cycle. So we are following a three-step approach. Budget period one was really looking at advancing the co conceptual design was a more of, are we happy with where we, where we are? Uh, we ended up going with a five stage to six stage design. So a lot of the conceptual design was looking at updating that. Now budget period two, which we're currently in is going into preliminary design, which is where we are now starting to do, do more detailed design of the aero, more detailed design of the turbine case, more detailed rotor dynamics, end seal selection, bearing houses, to really seeing what does this overall turbine look like? What is it gonna cost? And then budget period three will be detailed design, which is gonna be final assessment, um, start doing some mechanical drawings. So we can actually start assessing what the cost of the system will be. Uh, now, these designs are being evaluated based on API 612, 684 requirements, also with ASME Section 8 Div 2, along with piping codes ASME B311 and B313. So this just kind of overlays the overall program and uh, how we're going from start to finish between budget period one and budget period three from conceptual to detailed design. Um, you see everything in yellow is budget period one, and that's more of the preliminary assessments in terms of aero layout, um, conceptual layout of the turbine, initial cycle models. And then as you start moving from left to right, you start doing more, more assessment of, or more analysis, more testing. And so this involves material testing. This involves a more containment analysis, heat transfer testing, more advanced CFD trade studies starting to get to thermal transient, uh, thermal structural models, detailed design of the first stage plane, more details on the combustor design. Uh, all what we're open to output is a turbine detail design, a final cycle model focused on the turbine, and then a techno-economic assessment showing the cost of the system and you know what, what are factors that contribute to that and how can they be improved upon. And then I also want to break out since a big part of this program is in the um, the detailed fit first stage blade and vein design. Uh, so we do have um, about probably about half the program budget and schedule just focus on the particular first stage blade. And that includes the, the aero design, the mechanical design of the blade, the heat transfer uh, assessments, the material uh, selection and testing that's required to justify this blade. Now, high temperature blades in the gas turbine industry uh, many years of experience. So we are utilizing similar materials, but however, this is high pressure CO2. Uh, so there are, there are other, there, there's different compatibility factors at these temperatures between CO2 versus air. And so we want to understand what's the difference between air and CO2. And then how do we, what, how does that change our, our material selection for this particular program? Also, when you start introducing coal syngas byproducts, how does that impact your material choices? So what we identified, sorry, going to this program, what are the key risk items? Item one being the turbine layout. You know, it is a high, high pressure, high temperature system. What does this look like? What are the, what are the key areas of that in terms of pressure containment, thermal management, uh, sealing technologies. We want to evaluate what are, are going to be the right end seals, internal seals. This is going to include your, your blade to stator seals, your tip seals on your blades, your, your end seals, which we're going with labyrinth, your balanced piston seals. Are you going to use axial face seals? So evaluate what's going to work in the system. High temperature blade materials, thermal barrier coatings, and then also heat transfer coefficients. Uh, the main challenge here is that in, in, in terms of these small blades and the required cooling, we're approaching Reynolds numbers greater than 250,000. And so in terms of internal cooling, this is really pushing the limit on, on available knowledge for high flow internal cooling. 
And so we have entire test programs focused on just a value or just validating our assumptions for the internal cooling flow on these blades because that is so critical for the blade design that we're developing multiple rigs at UCF, also at Southwest Research, um, to look at how to understand what is the uh, heat transfer coefficients from these high flow coolings. How does the, the velocity or the Reynolds numbers of the flow affect those heat transfer coefficients to help us really optimize, can we reduce the cooling? Um, how much cooling do we actually need to really uh, look at the impact on overall cycle performance? So for budget period one, I'm really going to highlight what, what's been done in budget period one, because that was just completed about three months ago. And so we broke it up into main uh, five tasks. We have task 1.2 is a is syngas combustion cycle. 1.3 is heat transfer validation. 1.4 is the turbine conceptual design. 1.5 is combustor conceptual design. And then 1.6 is material testing. So the rest of my presentation is going to go through a couple of the, all these tasks and just get hit some highlights on what we accomplished and also address what, what we realized on key decisions by the end of budget period one. <clears throat> excuse me, so 1.2 is cycle model. Really what we wanted to look at here was we wanted to repeat some of our trade studies to make sure that we were picking the, the most efficient combination of turbine aero flow path and overall cycle efficiency, especially now that we're also going to include a coal syngas. Now, one important aspect of the cycle is that it will most likely be started up with natural gas. And so we do have to develop a turbine that can be co-fired between natural gas and also coal syngas. And so that does change the combustor design significantly. However, in terms of the turbine design, what we want to do is we want to maintain turbine inlet conditions at similar pressures, similar temperatures, but mainly similar volume flow. Uh, that's really the three key design parameters of a turbine. And so by maintaining volume flow, temperature, pressure, we can maintain really turbine performance across these different fuels. And we just need to balance the cycle to accommodate that. Um, but main things on the turbine inlet condition. So, so this turbine is designed for a little bit lower temperature than the previous one, which is designed for 1200C inlet. We're only looking at 1150C inlet on this one. Uh, but some of the things to note in terms of combustor design is that between the different fuels from natural gas to coal syngas, your fuel rate increases by almost five times. Um, your oxygen flow rate actually decreases by, by, uh, by 50% between natural gas to coal syngas. And so now you have to develop this combustion system that can main, try to maintain velocities throughout these different fuels to maintain combustion performance. Because if you have these very, very high fuel velocities or very, very low fuel velocities, you're going to have off design performance and you're probably not going to get complete combustion leading into overall performance impacts and uh, temperature uniformity going into your turbine. Uh, some of the heat transfer rigs that we are developing, one is a high flow heat transfer rig at Southwest Research. We are utilizing one of our current SCO2 test loops and developing a kind of a very uh, uh, internal cooling system that simulates what the internal blade passages would look like. So these are going to be larger, but what we're trying to target is Reynolds numbers, um, pressures and temperatures, uh, and also aspect ratios of the internal cooling. And so what we're planning to evaluate is going to look at smooth wall, Chevron enhanced walls, and also DMLS printed systems to look at the impact on overall turbine performance. And what we're trying to do here is trying to validate these internal cooling passages. And now we have this modular system where we can change out this one insert uh, to look how it affects the internal blade cooling. In addition to that, we're also evaluating what this internal cooling passages of the blade could look like. We have done some trial printing uh, to look at these serpentine passages, to look at the pin fin arrays. And this is really demonstrated on what we showed from the last um, project in terms of what this internal blade would look like. But we have, it's a central fed and it goes from serpentine from left to right. I think from what we're gonna be looking at for the final design is we're actually gonna take into account impingement cooling on the leading edge, which is one of the heat transfer rigs that UCF is developing. Uh, and then also looking at what, that tr what the blade tip cooling will look like. Uh, UCF is developing two rigs for this program. One is a pin fin test section to demonstrate those uh, trailing edge pin fins that, and also the impingement test section looking at impingement flow on the, on the leading edge of the blade. And so they're developing two rigs currently in process of assembling the impingement test and also finishing design on the pin fin. We also did, as I mentioned, we did the various trade studies on the turbine conceptual design where we basically updated our mean line layout. We looked at stages from four to eight and determine what was mechanically feasible. So as I mentioned before, we already know that going to six, seven, eight stages, our efficiency would increase. However, your cooling flow does increase. So if you look on the top right under cooling flow, you can see that as we increase stages, we require more cooling flow. 
more cooling flow is a direct impact to overall cycle performance because that is another loss that has to be accounted for. Um, however, so what we ended up finding out was that around the five, once you hit five, six stages, you start getting marginal increases in overall efficiency. And you also rotor dynamically, the seven and eight decides just didn't work. Um, so we had to go with the six stage design. Oh, that's what we, that's what we chose for this program and what we're moving forward with. Uh, we started doing some more advanced blade designs. And so Purdue is taking, taking lead on the, um, detailed design of these blades and looking at uh, CFD optimizations. And so you kind of see some of the, the range of blade shapes on the bottom left. Uh, we're really looking at some very advanced designs in terms of blade contouring to see how much efficiency can we get out of these blades and how does that impact overall cycle. We're looking at aero performance, but also heat flux into the blade to say, do these designs allow us to have reduced cooling, higher efficiency, reduced cooling, higher cycle efficiency. And so we're currently in the process of down selecting what our final first stage blade design is going to be. Um, continuing on, what we, what we are going with is also the updating the case design of the turbine. And so the main thing to note is that we are going with a horizontally split body with um, split bolts. Um, and the reason being is that this type of uh, construction allows for easy disassembly and maintenance of the rotor. So if there's a damaged blade, if there's a damaged combustor can, uh, the top halves of the casings can be removed and the entire rotor can be lifted out. If we, had, if we weren't able to do that, then you'd have to remove the entire case, rotate the case, remove the rotor. And so for just for assembly, just for maintenance issues or considerations, we wanted to make a horizontally split case. Now, this is a horizontally split case, at 400 C with 315 bar cooling flow coming in. So not an easy task, but the design in front of you shows that we have sufficient sealing along our split lines, which are just metal to metal seals, uh, sufficient contact pressure with the current bolt layout to show that we have a case design that will contain pressure to prevent leakage into atmosphere. Um, so we're currently updating this design, going through more detailed assessments, looking at pressure containment, looking at sealing loads um, to see that it is feasible or it's possible, and we can also manufacture it for the system. Uh, this just shows some of the rotor dynamic trade studies by directly coupling to the generator. Um, the, the FEA image in the middle shows our contact pressure greater than 9,000 PSI, which shows we have sufficient sealing, and then overall stresses in the system. In addition to the case design, we also move forward with more combustor design, mainly looking at adjusting the fuel flows. So we started with our 100% methane design and then looked at the impact of what when you change the required fuel and oxygen conditions for a high CO syngas. And what you can see in that middle image on the bottom is that our, our flame is very much way downstream of the can and we do have incomplete combustion. So what we realize is that we have to maintain the same flow velocities going into the combustor can to get similar performance, the image on the left, the image on the right. The question is how do you do that? How do you develop a control system for that? And how do you get more uniform temperature distribution going into the turbine flow path? And then most likely our final design is going to be somewhat like this, where we're looking at individual combustor um, cans and transition pieces for each can. Rather than having a general plenum, uh, what we can do here is we can more tune the flow better. Rather than having decelerating flow, we can have constant acceleration, increase in velocity, and have more uniform temperatures going into the turbine um, first stage vein. Uh, because of the split, the horizontally split line design that we are developing, the, there's going to have to be changes in the combustor can and transition piece geometry at the split lines. And so by, by making them individual, we can make those adjustments to each can to give uniform distribution uh, or uniform flows going into the turbine. And the last part of budget period one was looking at material testing. We are, there are two rigs that are currently being run at Southwest Research. Uh, there is a thermal cyclic rig, which takes the material up to 1150C, holds for 50 minutes, and then rapid cools with air. And what this is demonstrating is the cyclic performance of the TBCs and also long duration exposure at these temperatures. We are, we are doing air tests right now, but we'll be looking at CO, you know, fill in that cavity with CO2 and compare air to CO2 and see the overall impact. And then we also have a high temperature autoclave where we are immersing materials in high pressure CO2 at 1150C, looking at TBC, looking at bond coated only, looking at various nickel alloys. And we're trying to assess what's the optimal material for each of these um, sections. So obviously the, the cheaper the material, the overall impact on capital expenditures, um, but we're trying to find what can survive the environment and what's gonna give us the best mechanical performance while also reducing cost. So key decisions that were that we obtained during this program was to 
Uh, to have an effective co-fired system between natural gas and syngas, we will have to require some mixing in the fuel and oxygen nozzles to maintain velocity. Uh, we can design the turbine for steady inlet conditions, volume, flow, temperature, pressure. Um, we are doing, we are updating our internal blade cooling by using impingement cooling and serpentine cooling with pin fins. Um, we have chosen the six stage axial turbine that we feel is optimal for cost performance mechanical. Uh, we're still evaluating blade designs, unshrouded versus shrouded, but most likely unshrouded. Um, for our end seals, we are planning to use labyrinth seals with reinjection. This is because of the high temperatures and also the sim more simplicity. And then moving forward with the horizontally split case directly coupled to the generator and then looking at what is required for rotor to blade interaction in terms that we're going with circumferential dovetails for simplicity in terms of cost and manufacturing. Uh, with that, I'd just like to open the floor up to any questions. Thank you so much, Stefan. Um, I think for the moment, uh, we don't have any questions uh, for you, so I think uh, we can move on to the next uh, presentation. Perfect. Thank you very much. And Tim, can you confirm uh, if, if Steve will be going next or if we have Owen up? Yes, Steve White will be next. Steve, you're on, right? Yep. Okay. All right. All right. My name is Steve White, and um, I'm a mechanical design engineer here at Southwest Research Institute. Um, I've been working on the oxy combustion project uh, for, uh, I guess, involved in it for a couple of years now. And uh, we are at the point where we are just starting to assemble uh, our test stand. So I'm going to be talking in a little bit about that oxy combustor. Um, let me share that. All right. That should be working now. Okay. So uh, the the objectives of this project. This is a, a Department of Energy pro, uh, Department of Energy funded project. Uh, the objectives uh, of this project were to design a one megawatt uh, thermal oxy fuel combustor. Um, we wanted to target a 1200 C outlet temperature for that uh, combustor. And uh, that, had, uh, that had a lot to do with uh, previous work done here, uh, identifying about 1200 C is where we would want to be for a turbine inlet temperature. Um, this project is just uh, looking at the combustor, just designing and building the combustor. So once the design was done, we move on to manufacturing uh, the, the combustor hardware, assembling the test loop and commissioning the oxy fuel combustor. So that's about where we're at right now. Uh, and then we'll move into our full testing phase uh, where we're gonna evaluate and characterize combustor performance. Uh, we're using optical access uh, into the combustor for advanced diagnostics. Um, we're partnering actually with Georgia Tech and uh, Spectral Energies for that optical uh, uh, advanced diagnostics. All right, um, so Tim, Tim talked a little bit about uh, the cycle conditions and such. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, our target conditions were chosen from a, a previous project done here uh, at Southwest Research Institute. Uh, so, uh, our combustor inlet temperature was determined to be 700 C at 200 bar, uh, and outlet temperature, as I mentioned, was 1200 C. Uh, this, these numbers were picked because they would achieve a plant efficiency uh, comparable to a natural gas uh, carbon capture power plant. So here's a uh, schematic of our, uh, of our oxy combustor. Uh, on the left-hand side is where the main uh, supercritical CO2 enters. Um, again, it's coming in at about 700 C. Uh, in order to reduce costs of materials, um, we are coming in with, uh, with some cooling CO2 that acts as a buffer gas here. So uh, the, the main part of our uh, pressure vessel that's containing, containing the combustor is uh, made out of a 347H stainless rather than a high nickel alloy, which uh, would be able to um, 
be better suited for uh, for these high temperatures. But again, in order to keep costs down, so we went with uh, a stainless alloy uh, and introducing cooling CO2 and buffer gas so that we can keep the, uh, the pressure vessel cooler than what the uh, internal temperatures and the combustor temperatures are going to be. Um, so again, moving left to right, here we're going to be introducing uh, some bypass gas. This is going to come in and uh, it's going to cool the combustor liner. So that's a, a typical feature. We've got cool film cooling slots, uh, recirculation zones, and dilution holes um, to uh, control the combustion, um, the combustion activities there. Um, here we're going to be introducing our oxygen into this main line of uh, CO2 and pre-mixing it there. Uh, and then fuel is introduced here at the face of the combustor and uh, where we swirl it. Here we have our advanced optical diagnostics. So these are um, water-cooled uh, water -cooled probes that will allow us to uh, be able to visualize what's going on in here. Uh, on this side, this is uh, our laser ignition system. After the uh, combustor exit, we're dumping quenched CO2 into it. It goes through an exhaust mixer to cool all of this down before we get uh, to the exit and uh, re-enter our main loop. Again, this is just to uh, bring our temperatures down from this 1200C outlet temperature back down to temperatures that, that all of our hardware and piping can, uh, can uh, operate at closer to 400C. Uh, so talk a little bit about the oxygen system. Um, we, we worked with uh, personnel at NASA Stennis uh, and NASA White Sands, um, as well as our, our project partner, Air Liquide. Um, all, of these, uh, all of these entities gave us uh, some, some really good guidance on oxygen systems, as well as uh, oxygen injector. Um, we are using a, a LOX tank, uh, so it's cryogenic oxygen that uh, we're going to pump through a vaporizer, uh, and then that's going to be feeding our, uh, our system. This, this saves a lot on um, actually having our own um, oxygen, uh, oxygen tanks uh, on site. This way we can uh, rent a, a LOX tank, connect it to our pump and vaporizer, and uh, supply our oxygen as needed. Um, as I said, the oxygen injector is uh, upstream of the fuel injector. So the oxygen and the CO2 will be pre-mixed before it uh, enters the chamber and before the methane is introduced. Um, so then we get to the fuel injector and uh, this is made from, uh, it's an additive manu additively manufactured uh, Haynes 282. Um, we, we worked on it with, a lot of different designs uh, and iterated uh, numerous times to get here, um, but ultimately chose a, a 32 degree swirl angle for the inlet veins. Um, and then we had to add CO2 cooling, face cooling uh, ports here uh, to ensure that the, uh, the combustion didn't uh, actually reside on this face and, and get everything too hot here. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are controlling the, uh, the combustor cooling bypass gas separately. So this is on its own separate line so that we can modulate this for our test facility. This allows us, uh, as we are operating at different conditions, light off versus ramping it up versus our uh, steady state points, um, we can add or reduce uh, combustor cooling, film cooling, so that uh, if our, uh, you know, if we're adding too much at light off, we can reduce it so we don't blow out the flame. Uh, if we are uh, getting too hot, we can increase that uh, so that we don't melt the combustor. Uh, we're using a laser ignition system uh, for, for this, and uh, the, the piece of hardware that we're using is a, a Quantel QSmart Twins. Um, we designed, with the, the help of uh, one of our project partners, we designed a, uh, a water-cooled probe that uh, will allow the laser to, uh, to be inserted into the probe and, and fire into the combustion chamber without any of the laser hardware uh, being exposed to te high temperatures or pressures. 
uh, one of the big pieces of hardware uh, that uh, is not exactly a commercial off the shelf thing uh, was the water separator. So we are gonna be operating with natural gas and uh, oxygen as the fuel and oxidizer. And so uh, in this combustion uh, conditions, we're gonna be generating a significant amount of water, which obviously you don't want going back through uh, your compressor section. So uh, a water separator uh, was manufactured to, to deal with this. Um, we reached out to a lot of different vendors um, and, and uh, none of which were really familiar with separating water from CO2. It's not really a commercially uh, done thing. Um, so uh, working with them and, and iterating on where we were gonna put the water separated in, in our loop, um, we came to the conclusion that it, it, it was uh, best where our temperatures and pressures were lower because that made uh, the difference in densities between our uh, CO2 and water the greatest. Uh, and, and that'll give us the greatest chance of, of efficiently and fully removing the water from our system. So now to focus a little more on the combustor design. Um, again, this project has been going on uh, for, for various years and we started out uh, working with GE Global Research. Um, they were able to provide uh, CAD geometry from a heritage swirler. Uh, and so that's where, where the design started. We said, what's gonna happen if we just take this commercial off the shelf swirler and try to do oxy combustion with it? Um, so, uh, well, seems obvious now, but th that design didn't quite work very well in our simulations. Uh, and so we went through a lot of different uh, design iterations uh, changing, as you can see, oh, sorry, changing here, the, the design of the combustor can, um, where the swirler meets the, uh, the combustor and, and, and those angles, um, necking it back down to, to keep the flow down the middle and keep a good film cooling, uh, as well as recirculation to, to promote steady combustion. Uh, a lot of CFD was work. Work has been done. Um, throughout the process, we have to consider a lot of different things here. Um, heat release and flame holding, uh, cooling and recirculation schemes. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, a lot of mesh sensitivity studies to make sure that uh, we're not overcomplicating this and, and, and making each run longer than it needs to be. Uh, because again, we, we've done uh, well over a hundred different iterations uh, throughout the project. And so you wanna make sure you're not wasting your resources there. Um, we were looking at unreacted products, um, equation of state, the turbulence, wall temperatures, uh, chemical kinetics. We had to consider startup conditions versus, um, versus steady state conditions um, and uh, in injection point and swirl angle. Uh, all of those things are, are so many knobs to tweak in this, uh, in this design. And, and so a lot of CFD was run looking at all these different options. Uh, so towards the end of the design uh, phase, um, really dozens of iterations as we are doing small tweaks, trying to get the, the, the wall temperatures down, making sure that we weren't still getting hot spots and that our recirculation zone what was looking large enough to, to stay self-sustaining, um, lots and lots of iterations. And uh, at, at that point is when we realized, okay, we're trying to fine tune this thing, um, but we had been using steady RAN simulations. Um, now that's a great way to start your work uh, as we were uh, you know, trying to decide what does this thing look like? Where do we inject? Um, how, how do we recirculate the, the hot gases? Um, but it, it's not as uh, accurate, doesn't have the fidelity of, uh, of unsteady DDAS simulations. So we switched over from uh, steady RANS to unsteady DDS to see, okay, uh, how do we think this is really gonna look? Um, and so what we found when we switched over, same design, just using uh, unsteady uh, simulations instead of steady was that uh, there was a lot of oscillatory shear layer uh, mixing and, and that hot gas was hitting the walls 
uh, where we weren't seeing in the study. Uh, the recirculation zone was significantly different. Um, so uh, at that point, we had to do a few more tweaks. Um, this is where we started changing uh, our swirl angle, changing our recirculation uh, flow rates, our dilution uh, flow rates. It, it was small tweaks, but it, it still took you know uh, quite a number of iterations to make that uh, that unsteady flow case uh, acceptable. So uh, we got to the point that uh, we're watching our 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 wall temperatures and. and this was uh, assuming an adiabatic uh, wall temperature or wall temperature conditions, um, which in, in actuality, uh, we're going to have cooling gas coming across this and we're going to be losing heat there. So uh, targeting, you know, below 1000 C for our Haynes 282 material and um, throughout all these iterations, we, we finally got to a point where we felt comfortable with the combustor design and uh, and we sent it off to print. So again, um, uh, at this point, we're we're fabricating a lot of these materials, uh, a lot of these components, and uh, getting close to the point that we can assemble and start commissioning work. All right, that's it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Steve. Um, and then I believe our last presenter uh, is Owen Pryor. Yes, I'm just setting up right now, so. Perfect. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so now that we've kind of gone over the machinery design, um, I'm gonna talk about a project where we're actually trying to uh, incorporate the alum cycle into a highly renewable future electric grid. So this is high renewable penetration. Um, that Arbor E has provided us with uh, several several different scenarios of what they envision this possible this electric could look like, and so we are trying to do uh, oxygen storage um, in order to actually do energy. So we can actually store energy as oxygen and then use that liquid oxygen to run um, the alum top cycle. So, um, so the concept. Uh, We've talked about this cycle a little bit. Um, this is the uh, modified kind of alum cycle um, that Eight Rivers has produced. Um, this is, so it's semi-closed loop. We do, uh, we do take out CO2 um, and that's just to maintain the, uh, the mass balance. But uh, this system, it's inherently carbon capture. Uh, I believe it's 98.2% is what Eight Rivers is, uh, is what they were telling us. Um, the other day. And then uh, we don't have any additional NOx or SOx because um, again, it is an oxy fuel cycle. So here's kind of the actual, uh, how we're doing the liquid oxygen. So what we're doing is we, and we're separating when we are uh, filling our liquid oxygen storage in time versus when we're actually running the, uh, the AFC here. So um, the actual air separation we do, uh, so instead of doing gaseous, which is the current um, iteration of uh, net, what net power is currently doing, we are, uh, we're taking a bit of a penalty um, and actually uh, separating all the way to liquid oxygen, but we're doing that when the energy price is as low as possible. Um, and then when energy prices are high, so when we don't have as much renewable energy, we actually run the uh, we run the cycle, um, and so what we actually have been uh, working with is understanding how um, how do we start up these systems? What's the timelines that it takes to start up? Uh, how large does the air separation unit need to be, as well as the storage? Um, we are working at the moment with a fixed three hundred megawatt electric, uh, so the same size that Stefan was working with in his system. But uh, now we are playing with different air separation unit sizes and liquid oxygen sizes as well. Um, so kind of how we're actually doing the detailed modeling. Um, so we have detest, detailed process modeling that Air Liquide has done for the ASU and Eight Rivers has done for the, uh, the Allen-Feltwood cycle. And then 
we've combined it with a uh, NPV optimizing algorithm so that we can actually optimize um, various parameters so we can actually get uh, the highest NPV possible. So here's, uh, here's kind of both the, uh, this here, one second, let me put on my pointer. So this is showing kind of this, um, how the allen febo cycle scales with power output um, and percent load. And then um, this is kind of also their combined version of how they look at the ASU. So in, in this process as well, we are looking at um, kind of more detail of the ASU. Uh, based on the early keys, um, comments, this is the largest, at least liquid oxygen ASU. Um, that anybody's ever kind of asked to be designed. So um, we're working with uh, Air Liquide has a integrated liquefaction technology that they're working on. Um, so it would be a single main air compressor that Soft and Way has been uh, doing detailed aerodynamics on. And then it goes into the liquid storage tank. And as you can see here, we vaporize and it goes to the power plant. Um, so our air flows in this case, is yeah, almost you know, 700 meters cubed per hour. Um, and so we have been doing a lot of detailed work on that. Um, so yeah, there we go. In terms of the uh, actually what I've been working on, which is the kind of taking the system level approach, um, we've actually, so given a economic price uh, scenario, so these scenarios look at like, uh, Kaizo um, with a hundred dollar carbon tax is one of the scenarios. So it's the California region, um, and then they've given it a carbon tax to kind of ensure renewable penetration. Um, so we take that DOE price data. I I start looking at a system operational approach. When can I run the charge system? When can I run the discharge? Um, I get an economic model. So this is not looking at anything like what the storage capacity is. I then take that economic model and actually uh, I run it through storage. So we have, um, based on this, we have about uh, 48 to uh, 72 hours of kind of uh, look ahead. So we, we can see when we can uh, shut off and turn on ASUs and power blocks. But, um, and we do, uh, we do try to maintain as much power output as possible. So it will turn on the ASU if it needs to and the ASU is large enough to support uh, um, running both simultaneously. And then we've ran this through a genetic algorithm looking at eight different independent parameters. So these, um, these are six different operational parameters and uh, the ASU capex size. So ASU flow rate in this case and the storage max capacity so you can actually look at capex size as well as operational uh, parameters. Uh, in this, the only source of revenue um, we're allowed to look at is the energy we're selling. So there's no, no CO2 sales, no argon sales in ASU. We are only looking at the energy in this case. And our, our output is net present value. Um, yeah, so uh, the results from uh, so this is California. So this is the Kaizo region in particular with a $100 carbon tax. Um, so in this scenario, we're getting over $600 million in NPV. Um, uh, so this is over a 30 year period. And, but um, our storage capacity is only about 4.2 days. Um, and so this is pretty small for a lot of the different regions. It doesn't want a huge storage capacity. And as you can see, um, it, the code doesn't ever really want to go above 75%. Um, so it goes, it, you know, it quickly, it jumped up to about 100% at one point. Um, but really the peaks are usually about 75. And in this case, we are dis, uh, discharging uh, about 1,200 or 1,300 gigawatt hours per year. Um, and then I also wanted to zoom in and look at uh, kind of the most active months for this system were in the summer. So this is looking at both the energy projections of the system, as well as uh, what the economics look like. And as you can see, even though we are charging quite a bit, uh, and oftentimes when we are not running the, uh, the power block at the same time, 
there's only a few times that we're really losing money on a, on a you know, per hour basis. So, um, as you see, this one was, you know, quite well. So looking at a same region, but what happens if you increase the carbon tax? So in this scenario, um, we did take a little bit of an MPV hit, but, um, and a lot of that is probably because we quadrupled in size how much storage we wanted to do. So we're talking 16 days of storage here. Um, and we do not actually produce nearly as much energy, but we are still, uh, it's still a highly profitable uh, system. So this is kind of what we've been working on, um, looking at how the different you know, situations and economic situations occur and how our system will respond. Um, and this includes startup times, shutdown times uh, for both the ASU and charge, um, as well as minimum times that we can keep them running or maximum times we can keep them running, stuff like that. So there are a lot of different variables that are in play here. Um, and then the final one that I wanted to show you guys is, uh, so across the, across the country in Western Pennsylvania, again, with the higher carbon tax value, but um, this one had uh, the highest storage capacity at over you know, 100,000 tons here or 26 days. Um, and as you can see, again, only really reaching that really high peak capacity once. Um, and we are looking at uh, sensitivity. So what happens if, if I only have everything else the same and I lower this? Um, I am looking at that as well. But uh, these are currently just the uh, optimized results. And then your economics, uh, you do, you can see in August, we were losing money for pretty much all of August. Um, that was so we could charge the system back up. But uh, still we, uh, you know, for the most part, um, so what do the results look like over across all of our different scenarios? Um, so every one for the renewable energy flex, uh, kind of our, you know, the flex system, which is the, uh, Flexible carbon capture storage, which is funding this, has a positive return on investment. Um, now, we also looked at just what happens to the Allen Fetlot cycle with kind of as a baseload power plant in these situations. So that's 92.5% uh, capacity factor. Um, and so we outperformed pretty much every single one except for. Uh, as you can see, one of the ones I showed you guys um, here, the Alpha Cycle did outperform us by about $100 million or so. But it also dramatically, you know, it was not a good investment for several regions as well. So if, you know, if we do go to these high renewable penetrated markets, we're going to need to learn how to actually operate these plants in a transient operation um, scenario. And in addition to this, uh, I also looked at capacity factors. And uh, so we're talking for the charging of the system, because I can vary the ASU size, we're talking 25 to, or sorry, that's actually 30 to 95%. And then the discharge is anywhere from 25% to 85%. And even at 25% capacity factor, it was still a positive return on investment. So, um, and then so for a summary again, uh, we've been looking at, so a LOX producing uh, and storage instead of a uh, GOX for the ASU and how that would, uh, how the economics work for the Allen Fettbelt cycle, as well as, uh, you know, this is a not, quite net zero, but you know, 98% carbon capture system. Um, and then we're looking at you know, capital versus base load plant. We're also looking at uh, the economics, as I showed you guys, of the MPV versus the base load. And then um, we have, so one thing to note that the, so the penalty is it's about, I think with the current ASU model um, to produce locks, it is about a 90, I think it's about 90% penalty from going from uh, gaseous oxygen to liquid oxygen in terms of how much energy it takes to produce a, uh, a ton of oxygen. And even with that, 
you know, we were outperforming the base flow plan. So um, that's kind of what I have for, uh, for my stuff, so. All right, thank you so much, Owen. Uh, yep. With this last presentation, it seems we've, we've come full circle from, from the first question after Tim's presentation. Um, and with that, I just want to say uh, a hearty thank you to the Swery team for, for joining us today. Um, as, as a non-technical person, I think at, at times it, it was like a, a foreign language to me, um, but at the same time, a, a really super interesting set of presentations. Uh, for, for many of us, we do our best uh, not to have the perfect be the enemy of the good sometimes. Uh, but but you all are doing the exact opposite and not not allowing the good to be the enemy of the perfect uh, as you make the, the smallest of tweaks and then iterate and iterate and iterate. Um, it's it's just really cool to see. Uh, and, and I'm really confident this type of work and, and thinking will get us to to our carbon reduction goals. Um, now, we do have about 20 more minutes left here, um, so we will go back to uh, some of the questions that that came in. Um, and, and Tim, I saw that you answered this um, in, in the Q&A box, but, but for those uh, who, who may not have seen it, um, is there any work regarding potential dynamics of, of the operation? Um, and um, just if you could kind of uh, repeat the answer that, that you typed and, and maybe expand on it a little bit as well. Sure, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, I guess, yeah, dynamics of operation of these systems and, um, and transients are still a, 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 it's a really good question. And it's an important area that we're trying to demonstrate and advance, advance the maturity of. Um, my, I think, you know, I can answer that for the STEP project where we are funded to, to build and are, are near done building the pilot plant for an indirect SCO2 cycle. Uh, and in that one, we, have, we are fully analyzing all of the dynamics. Um, so there are transient models. There are actually multiple transient models of the, the power block, um, one of which is being analyzed in closed loop with our control system uh, to ensure that we're fully capturing the dynamics and the control system inputs required to successfully manage those dynamics. Um, so so that that problem, I guess, has a full solution, uh, assuming that our model is accurate, which will be validating when we run the test. Um, um, there are several papers in the literature. Um, I can point to several ASME papers that talk about some of those transient results. Um, if the reviewer, if the question, questioner wants to contact me at the info below, I can point them there. Uh, with oxy combustion systems, dynamics are also very important. In fact, maybe even more so. Um, because when you light off an oxy combustion closed loop cycle, um, that's a very fast thermal transient that impacts pressure rises throughout the closed loop system. Um, so it is a really good question to ask. Um, you've got to have a, a system that can respond and maintain appropriate pressures and temperatures throughout as that light off transient gets um, propagated um, all the way through and back around. Um, in terms of our work on that, uh, the models that are developed for the STEP facility can be applied. There, there is additional chemistry that's required to be modeled with oxycombustion, um, but the same approaches can be applied. Um, our projects have focused around component development and testing, so we haven't had funding to build transient models of that system. Um, so, you know, in order to to, you know, we've done bounding steady state analyses of before and after points to ensure that the loop will survive and, and be appropriate for operating um, these tests, but we don't have transient models of our oxycombustion loops. Got it, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for clarifying. Um, next, uh, we had a couple questions come in for Stefan um, right, right after um, your presentation. Um, the first one is what is the timeline for budget periods two and three? Yeah, and I know that uh, Stefan had some conflicts. Is, Stefan, are you on and are you able to speak to that question? If not, I can do my best. Um, yeah, I think, um, I mean, let me, 
find the formal project team. Um, yeah, in terms of the actual dates, I honestly, I, I don't, um, I don't have those dates right off the top of my head. Um, so I, I'm going to decline to answer that one, or you know, I can engage Stefan to answer that one separately later. Uh, in terms of who would manufacture, um, you know, that's going to be a function of the the project team that we have. Um, bringing up the names right now, just so I say it correctly. One moment. Okay, well, I'm having issues there, but, um, you know, on, yeah, I'm sorry, forgive me. I, I need to bring up the right answer before I talk about it. Not a problem. Um, we can move over or move on to the uh, two other questions that came in. Um, these, I believe, were for, for Steve. Um, what are the performances in terms of load following capabilities of the AFC or uh, what ramp megawatt per minute are you assuming? So that one's actually for me, oh. but um, yeah. So for the AFC, it ramps up at 25% uh, capacity per hour. So it, um, my, the data I have is per hour. So I, um, but yeah, so whatever 25% is divided by 60 would be the percent per minute. Um, and it's actually based on the uh, the heat exchangers in the uh, in the cycle. So the cycles they can uh, it takes them four hours if they're cool to heat up. So um, yep. And then uh, for the uh, just so you guys know for the ASU it takes uh, eight hours to start up the ASU if it is. Uh, if it's already at temperature, so that's cryogenic temperatures. If it's at atmospheric temperatures, it takes 72 hours to start up. And so my model does uh, does have to include those uh, those values. So I have to figure out a way every time I want to, every time it's been turned off for and lost temperature, I have to figure out a way to start it up for 72 hours. Um, and then uh, the ASU, yes, the ASU is able to uh, follow the grid. Um, so that is what it's supposed to be doing 100% of the time. Um, but in order to maximize energy output, it can turn on um, at a request basically from the power block if it needs oxygen. So um, yeah, the oxygen storage system, it has, it has a lower limit basically that if it hits that limit, it tells it either to turn the ASU on or turn the power block off. And turning the ASU on is the, uh, is the preferred response. So it can both follow, follow the grid as well as following uh, just requirements from the power block itself, so. Got it, thank you for that, Owen. Yeah. Um, and before we go back to Tim, just a reminder if anyone has any questions uh, any other questions or, or comments, feel free to type them into the Q&A box or, or the chat box. Um, Tim, were you, were you able to, to pull up those? Um, I was. <clears throat> perfect. So I do have answers there. Uh, the budget period two for our Oxy Turbine project that Stefan presented, uh, it ends the end of September this year. Uh, and then budget period three will end uh, one year from then. So the end of September, 2023. Uh, in terms of you know, who would make such a turbine? Uh, one of our project team members is, is GE. Um, and so GE is retaining an interest in being that commercialization partner. Um, we are also partnered uh, on that project with, um, you know, someone brought up earlier the fact that Net Power was doing that. So um, we are partnered with Eight Rivers, uh, Net Power's parent company on that. So again, all the teams are, are, are talking and, and the projects are complimentary. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Um, and I've uh, just attempted to make our um, acting executive director, Sheila Hollis, uh, a presenter, um, as she has some, some words that she'd like to share as, as well. 
Thank you so much, Alex. And thanks to this uh, extraordinary panel that's uh, way above my, uh, my pay grade scientifically, but your vision for the future, the intensity of the thinking, the complexity of the issue and the necessity to continue research and your efforts in this area are incredibly, incredibly welcome. And we're very grateful for your input today. Uh, just a bit about USEA. Uh, we've worked in 104 countries around the world with USAID, the State Department, um, and the Energy Department itself. Uh, and our goal is to reach out uh, to provide as much information and education as possible. Uh, we just uh, finished up our State of the Energy Industry program uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, which you may find, find useful to uh, review uh, in, in when your time allows. But uh, we continue the saga with DOE, USAID, state, and we also uh, try to promote uh, our members with the board of our uh, association represents most of the major energy players in the country and the various forms of energy uh, and uh, delivery of that energy. So thank you all so much for giving your time and your brilliance to this program. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila, and, and thank you again to, to the SWERI team. Um, one last reminder that this uh, webinar has uh, been recorded uh, and we will be posting it onto the event page um, in the next day or two. Um, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, and with that, uh, we will give everyone nine minutes of, of their time back uh, and hope that you have a uh, a uh, good rest of your week and, and hope everyone stays uh, safe and healthy um, and we will see you next time. Okay, thank you. <laughs>